Hello, this is Chris with Phoenix Gaming. Today we're going to talk about terrain and table layouts. In this video, we're going to talk about what my philosophy on layouts are and terrain. We're going to talk about GW's old layout, their new layout, and then my thoughts on putting varied terrain on the table. And what I feel is probably one of the better ways to implement player-placed terrain. Let's dig in. So my philosophy on terrain and layouts. Personally, I like to minimize the ability for players to camp and shoot from deployment zone to deployment zone. I also try to provide cover by all the objectives, and this will make sense from a logical standpoint. You know, objectives should represent important areas on the board, like a key terrain feature or maybe even just like an important object. But most of the time, if you've ever been in an actual battlefield, those important objects aren't just lying out in the open for everybody to go and get. You know, and if they are out in the open, it's it's usually like it's a trap, right? So it's just one of those things to keep in mind when you're building your tables that generally speaking, if there's something important, like if you're playing a narrative game and you're trying to get to an important ammo crate or some other artifact or whatever, most of the time they're not just lying out in the open because people would have been trying to protect them. I don't need symmetry, but I do prefer it for competitive games like tournaments and such, but for games with my buddies, it's a lot less important. It is nice to have for tournaments because in a tournament setting, you want players to walk away knowing that they lost the game because of something they did and not because of something you as an organizer failed to do. I also feel like the terrain should be part of the game. It shouldn't just be an obstacle or thing you need to work around. It should be part of the flow of the game. It should not hamper it. And what we're going to do now is we're going to hop on a table and we're going to visualize as we do. Okay, so we all know this is GW's Terrain Layout 1. We're going to talk about what I mean from by not camping, and we're going to talk about what I mean by protecting objectives. So what we'll do is we'll get our blue marker. We'll put an objective right here in the middle. Uh, we'll slap one's right around here-ish. I think the other's right around here-ish. And then... And we're just ballparking again. They don't need to be perfect for what we're doing. Okay, so if these are our objectives, and let's say our deployment zone is... Now what we do is we look at this and we go, okay, do we have big deployment zone to deployment zone shooting lanes? And hopefully the answer is no, or if you do, they're not, you know, there's not a ton of them. You know, like I said, what you don't want is you don't want players being able to sit in their deployment zone and just shoot their whole army at the other player so that if they go first, they just win. That's not what we want. You know, uh, you do have some shooting lanes if you look, but it doesn't really hit the deployment zone. Now, obviously, you can maybe get something in this corner uh, or worst case scenario, you could move up and have it. But I can just put things here and you can't shoot them. So you have a little bitty like maybe a lane here but it's blocked and then you have a lane here and then obviously you have this lane right but what we can't do is we cannot stand on this objective and just shoot directly across the table and pick apart my opponent and you know it's one of those where it seems like common sense but i've had a lot of people say hey i don't necessarily understand how to set up a table so i i wanted to make sure we talk about it so we don't have that we can't just sit in our deployment zone and table our opponent in a single turn. Now let's look at objectives. Obviously, we have this one here in our home. Now we can control it here and not have to worry about getting shot. It's an important area of the battlefield, so it makes sense that it is protected to some degree. Now we do have this one right here in the middle, and it does have a little bit of protection. You can't really hide in a terrain feature. But if I come through here, I can control it without having to worry about getting blown off the board. Your lines from here are going to be very limited. Your lines from here are going to be very limited. So you're much more likely to get charged in the middle of the board. Or, you know, they have to at least move closer to the center of the board in order to shoot it. This objective here, I can't remember the distance. You might be able to hide on this footprint and control it. But even if you can't, you should be able to either get here or here to be within three. And then you still are forcing your opponent to have to come over and shoot or come from the middle and shoot. 
So that objective is pretty well protected as well. So that's what I mean when I say your objectives should have some kind of protection. I, they don't necessarily have to be, let's flip back to the blue pen real quick. They don't have to be, we don't have to move it in here so that I can just sit in the building and hold it the whole day. What we want is we want them to be relatively protected, but also open enough that it forces players to have to interact with each other. That's what we want when we set these tables. We want the terrain and the objectives to be put in a way that players have to keep moving and interact with each other. If we took this objective and this terrain feature and we moved it here, and then we moved these in so that they really tightened up around it, we've now created objectives that once a player gets there, you're going to have a hard time getting to it. And from a competitive sense, that's not what we want. We don't want to play a two-player game that's really just a one-player game. If I wanted to play a one-player game, I would just play Solitaire. Now, let's talk about GW's old 9th Ed layouts. I did not like them. When they came out, man, I had a couple local players that thought they were just a bee's knees. And I thought they were atrocious. I think they were a step in the right direction for Games Workshop in terms of trying to do something to balance a game that was very imbalanced at the time. I do think the massive footprints generally could provide good line of sight blocking, but they lacked a lot of depth in strategy. Uh, if you played against Blood Angels, for example, literally every game was the same. I'm going to move my jump pack guys here, and then as soon as you get in range, I'm going to charge. Like The game became very stale when it was built around these layouts, simply because they just weren't varied, and they just lacked a lot of creativity and depth. And I'm not putting Games Workshop down for this. Like I said, I feel like it was a step in the right direction. I'm just saying these were the issues I had with it. They didn't really require any kind of thinking to play on. And like I said, I feel like the terrain should be part of the game. Like they should contribute something to the game. Uh, there were certain mission combinations and terrain combinations that created massive shooting lanes with very limited hiding space. And let's look at that. So this is terrain setup one. And the first mission I want to look at with this is anything with Dawn of War, which means we're going to have this, we're going to have this. Now, almost all the Dawn of War missions had an objective right here. And then a lot of them, well, I guess there was only... Like Abandoned Sanctuaries, I think, was this one. And this is basically Abandoned Sanctuaries. And the way these were spaced, there was no protection on these. Like, if you went to a Games Workshop event, the way the walls and stuff were set up, in order to control this objective, you had to be in this massive shooting lane right here. So it really, really benefited shooting armies to play on this specific layout. Uh, these right here were... WYSIWYG, which meant they had windows. If you could see, you could shoot. So in order to hold those, you either had to be butted right up against this footprint, if I remember right, uh, or in it. And if you were in it, you could just get shot off the table and you had this massive lane right here. So this, this is why I don't like this layout. Let's look at it a little bit more in depth. These were treated as woods and they're relatively useless in these back corners. Uh, they did provide a little bit of mobility protection if you had a unit back there doing some sort of objective, but generally they were just kind of, it's almost like an afterthought. They were looking at it and they were like, oh, what the hell, let's throw them in the corner. You know, there's empty space in the corner. They would have been much better suited if maybe they were not woods. You know, maybe we treat them as ruins and then move them up a hair or even, I don't know, just anything would have been better, I feel like, than those. So those woods, really weird. These pieces right here, also really weird. Because you have this real narrow lane here, which is fine because it's not the end of the world. You know, you've still got hiding places. But the downside was you also had this massive one here. So if you wanted to not get shot off the table, your whole army basically had to fit here and here. And then, you know, you could obviously, I think, I, I don't remember the exact measurements, but you could put some dudes in the footprint as well and that was fine but it, it's one of those where this layout was just not very good however they did have a layout let's clear all this out and that was this one but the problem is this layout was almost too much 
And again, if you've ever played against anything with jump packs, for example, every game was literally, I'm going to move my guys here. They're going to sit here. As soon as you get up here, I'm charging you. Uh, and with a 12-inch movement, a lot of them could just bridge that gap and get there. But it was just very stagnant. The game became very same. Uh, and I'm not, again, I'm not taking anything away. At least the effort was put in to make a uniform terrain layout. I'm just showing you what I didn't like about it. But I will say if you are struggling and you guys don't have a good terrain setup, this is a good starting point. Looking at the GW official layouts is a great starting point if you are struggling to get a good terrain setup for your games. GW's new layouts, I think these are a lot better. I like them a lot more. They are multiple smaller footprints instead of fewer larger ones, and it does create a more dynamic feel. I think these layouts work very well with the deployment zones, and you can definitely tell that a lot more thought and effort was put into these. It feels like the first ones were a band-aid to kind of patch the game, but then as they saw that they were kind of working, they refined the process and just made it a lot better. Let's take a look at those and see what I mean by this. So this is Terrain Layout 1, and we've looked at this a ton on my channel, uh, mostly because I just kind of randomly pick one. Uh, and, and the reason I always do this objective layout is just because I, I generally know it pretty well. It's, it's not because it's like my favorite or anything. It's just I, I generally know it. I don't have the rough outline of some of the other ones memorized. And this also, I think, is in multiple deployment zones but let's make this search and destroy right let's do that so here's our deployment zones and again you know me not to scale i'm not a good artist and i'm even worse with a mouse now here's what i mean by creating a more dynamic feel we have a lot of little places that we can hide instead of a few big places so i have now more options on how i want to move and maneuver so if I'm playing my Sisters of Battle, for example, if I've got Zephyrim, I could maybe put him here. And then I could maybe auto advance him with a Miracle Die to get him up here. Or I could even put him here. And then I could move him out behind here. Or I could even start with him right here if I wanted to, depending on what my opponent is playing and, and what stuff they have on the table. So it just creates a lot more options and variety for deployments. It creates a lot more options and variety based on your matchups and your mobility. So to me, the new layouts are very representative of what I like to see on a table. Like I said, we don't have good lanes for shooting, but we do still have some lanes for shooting, but it's not a shooting gallery. Let's look at one other layout, and I think this might be one I haven't talked about before. Oh, I got to turn the pen off first. Okay, so this is layout two. So we're going to do Dawn of War. Let's put the objectives out. So we got one here. We got one here. We got one here. And then we've got one here. And we've got one here. Our deployment zone is roughly here. And roughly here. So now let's take a look at this one. We've got a shooting lane here. We've got this weird little lane here. And then we've got this lane here, and then we've got one here, and then we've got one here, right? Like, we do have some shooting lanes, but man, do we have a lot of places to hide. Let's take a look at this. So again, if we use that example where I'm like, hey, I'm going to play my sisters. If I've got my Zephyrim, I could put them here and fly to here. I could even fly to here. I could put them kind of back here. And then bounce them up. You know, and it, again, if it's a small unit, you can hide them even better. I don't run small units of Zephyrim. Uh, if I'm playing my Drukhari, I can put my witches here and advance or get them up here. I can put them here. You know, so you still have these options. When you control this objective in your home, you have plenty of protection. You have places to hide so that you could screen if you want to. You can come up here and control this objective come up here control the objective the middle uh, I think is probably kind of open but again it's not the worst like you have this big shooting lane but you also have two objectives on the wings here that you don't have like you can just move up and control those 
and then not play the middle of the board. And again, if you are a fan of my videos, you know that because of how I play, I avoid the middle of the board, right? I'm playing T3 bodies with shitty saves, uh, and I'm just picking up models. So by and large, I'm just like, hey, you can have the middle of the board. I'm just going to take everything else, and then I'm going to collapse in around you. And again, this layout affords the ability to do that with the ability to come up, come up, come here. You can come up here. You can come here. Like you have options as long as you have the units to do it. So again, I think the new layouts, very good for the philosophies that I tend to have with terrain. And that's that you don't have deployment zone to deployment zone shooting. You And even if you do, you have plenty of hiding space and you have a lot of smaller footprints to be able to move around and interact rather than just a few big ones where it's, okay, everybody knows what's going to happen this game every game. So here are my thoughts on varied terrain. I'm going to upfront tell you guys, I think that by and large, the terrain rules for 10th edition are a, a double-edged sword, so to speak. I think that they kind of suck because they're overly simple, but I also appreciate that they're overly simple. And here's what I mean by that. I appreciate the fact that woods and ruins give you the same kind of cover, not because I couldn't handle remembering dense cover, but because I can't count the number of times I had to tell people how dense cover worked when I either ran or played an event. So the fact that they don't have different types of cover from an organizational standpoint makes my life easier. But as a player, I don't like the lack of variety. I don't like the fact that woods are just ruins that you can see through, right? They're not obscuring. I do like aesthetically pleasing tables as much as the next person, but I will say that GW layouts do lack variety. It's all ruins. There's nothing else. There's a reason for this. And, and the reason is because all the ruins block line of sight until you're in them, right? They're all quote unquote obscuring. And so they can just use the ruins to give cover and the block line of sight and to just minimize the effect of shooting on the game. If they were woods, we'd have shooting galleries and then half the armies in the game really wouldn't be able to interact. So it's one of those where this is why the organized play tables tend to all be ruins. That doesn't mean you have to run it that way. But I will say if it has a footprint, I think you should just run it as ruins. Do you like forests? Put forests on the table, put them on a footprint, treat it as a ruin. There's there's a couple reasons for this. A, they now block line of sight, which is what I think a lot of players are lacking when they're playing like basement hammer or garage hammer, is they're just putting terrain features on the table that they really like the look of, and they're not necessarily considering the impact it'll have on the game. Uh, and I've had some comments that are like, hey man, like my buddy plays a shooting army and I just can't. I can't interact with the game. And I would be willing to bet that most of those times it's because they just have nothing to block line of sight or they just have a few pieces of terrain. Like there's just not enough. If you're theming tables, you know, if you're doing a a forest, like here's my death world jungle and I am theming this whole table as a jungle death world, it makes all of your terrain consistent. You have clear and concise layouts and rules. You don't have to worry about, well, does this tree be a ruin or does this tree be a ruin? You just change the size of your footprints to have them kind of change the way they interact on the game. And then in addition to that, it just offers more protection for those melee armies. You know, if you play uh, a melee focused army, a Drukhari or a, you know, Zephyrum based sisters or Repentia based sisters type army or whatever, you're going to need places where you can hide models. And if they're not there, you're never going to, you're not even going to have fun because you're just going to be picking up whole units. Again, I would just, if it has a footprint, run it as a ruins. Outside of craters, obviously those don't make sense to run as ruins. But I would say if it's a forest, you run it as a ruin. If it's a ruin, you run it as a ruin and you move on. Also keep in mind that the game is balanced around a certain amount of terrain and line of sight blocking terrain. So if your Warhammer bro is a Votan player and homie's just like, all of these are forests, rules as written, and then he just shoots you off the table, cool man, now we're going to treat them all as ruins and we're going to see if that can help. And I'm not saying people do that intentionally. There are players out there that do. I've met a few, but ultimately I think a lot of people just do it, right? I, I tend to kind of assume that they're not being malicious. They're just being dumb.
for lack of a better word. You know, so it's one of those where if if you're running into issues with certain matchups, where it's like any time I play against this X army, I'm just getting killed. Look at your terrain and see how it interacts with the game. See if it hits those checkpoints we talked about. Does it offer protection on objectives? Does it deny uh, DZ to DZ shooting? Does it interact with the game in a positive way? Or does it interact with the game in a negative way? Player place terrain. I know a lot of players like this. For fun games, I enjoy it. For competitive play, I'm not a big fan. Uh, I personally prefer, you know, for, for tournaments that I go to and stuff, I would prefer a, just a symmetrical table. I don't want to have to go and set up the table when I go to play at a tournament. I'm already paying you to play. And this is my, this is actually my thoughts on it as an organizer, and it's why I rarely used player's place terrain when I organize. You're paying to play. And if you are paying to play, I want you to be able to come in, if you want to use your own objective markers, you can. If you can't or don't, I will have them there for you. But you're paying me money to come play a game. I want you to come in. I want you to put your models on the table. And I want you to play a game. And I want you to walk away happy. One of my philosophies as an organizer has been I will hardly ever use player place terrain. Because to me, that detracts from the gaming experience from an organized standpoint. Because you're paying to play. You should just be playing. Now, I know that that is different than other people's, and that's fine. They're not right. I'm not right. They're not wrong. I'm not wrong. We just have a different mindset. One of the reasons I don't like player place terrain, and I've seen some of the rules for certain events that use player place terrain, and I'm not going to name any. I'm not going to like drag anybody through the mud, but I will tell you some of these events, if they use player place terrain, that game is decided on the terrain roll off most games. And the player placement or the terrain placement when it's done by players is almost like a mini game. And if you have somebody who's just inherently more experienced at it and they win that roll off, they're going to shut you out. They're going to block out your terrain features. They're going to make sure you don't interact with the game in a meaningful way. And again, I understand that that is part of the nature of player place terrain, but that's why I personally don't use it as much when it comes to my events. What I will say is that if you choose to, if you're like, hey, I really like player place terrain or like when we do it for like our narrative stuff and our, our just like fun games. Uh, we use one and this this has actually been modified. I've gotten feedback from people. Uh, we, we kind of did a collective and said, let's start here. Let's play a few leagues. Let's do a few tournaments with it and let's get feedback and then we'll tweak. So this is after some tweaks and it may still need more tweaking, but this is where we're at right now. Uh, I would suggest that both players get one 10 by 10 footprint, one or two six by 12 footprints, and one six by six footprint, and then an armor container and a crater. That will put a total of 12 pieces of terrain on the table, uh, a couple of big ones, a few or, or a few more small ones. You know, you've got your armor containers and your craters. Then what you'll do is you'll roll off for terrain placement. The winner will obviously drop first. That's not a choice. And then when they put their terrain feature down, it must be three or four inches from another feature and a table edge. And then the feature itself can't go on an objective. So the footprint, the objective could be on the footprint, but the wall can't be on the footprint. Okay. And then the footprint can't be on a second story or an armor container. So you couldn't put an armor container on a feature or the, or put an armor container on an objective or the objective on the armor container or do silly things like that to mitigate your opponent's ability to interact with the objectives. So they are three or four inches and it's really going to be dependent on what armies you're playing, what your list looks like. You know, you guys try it one way. If you don't like it, try it another way. If you do three inches, you can tighten up the board a little bit and things are a little easier to fit. If you do four inches, it could be a little bit bigger spacing to allow for bigger models, but it could be a little harder to maneuver all those features on the table. The armor container and the crater can be placed anywhere. There's no restrictions on it. So if you wanted to put the armor container on the 10 by 10 footprint, you could, right? That's a thing you could do as long as it's three inches away from the feature itself and three inches away from the objective, etc. You could even put the armor container right up against the edge of the table. It doesn't matter. And then the crater's the same way because the crater doesn't even impede movement. It doesn't do anything. You could actually put an objective 
like you could put the objective in the crater if you wanted to because it can't impede the movement it can't restrict anybody from getting to it so that's not the end of the world and then once you place your terrain features if you get to a point where a feature can't fit you find the spot on the table that gets it as close to fitting as possible and it just goes there period end of discussion uh you you place it in a way that you get as close to that three or four inch buffer zone as possible and you just put it there. Once all the terrain is placed, then you roll for attacker and defender. You roll after terrain player or terrain is placed. And so I've been, again, I've been to events where they roll for terrain placement in the attacker defender role, which means if you place first, you get to pick deployment zone. Is, is it, or no, what is it? You roll for attacker defender, you figure out which side your deployment zone is, then you set the table. Uh, and I don't like that because if you roll for attacker defender second, it will help promote players to create a more fair and balanced table. If if you and I are playing a game, we're setting the table and I know that there's a possibility I could lose the attacker defender role and I could lose my perfect deployment zone setup. I'm more willing and more likely to just create a more balanced board rather than just try to cheese the system and try to use the terrain as a weapon against you. Because it's a 50-50 die roll, I could end up with the wrong side of the table, and then I'm the one that's getting cheesed, right? Even though I set it up. Now, there are still players that are going to try it, absolutely. But I'm just saying, in, in all reality, rolling attacker defender after terrain is placed promotes a, a healthier interaction at the table, in my opinion. You make sure all features hit the table. If it can't fit, you just find a spot to make it fit. And that, again, prevents players from placing things to block out opponent's terrain. And it mitigates, it helps mitigate losing the game on a die roll. You know, if I won and I get to place my 10 by 10 first, I could place it in a way to really try to choke out your last couple pieces of terrain. And what this does is this is like, okay, well, if it doesn't fit, we just make it fit. It's not a perfect system. Uh, the footprints can be a bit cumbersome. Like they're like the one 10 by 10 is kind of big and there's a lot of them. We're talking about six total pieces per player, right? So 12 total pieces, but I have played this system at multiple leagues and events and the feedback I've received has generally been positive. The, the biggest negatives I've heard is that it can get a little crowded but the players have have come to me and said, hey, this gets a little crowded and we've we've reduced the number of footprints and shrank a couple of the footprints. And by doing that, it's it's helped create a little bit less crowded of a table. Overall, I like to try to limit deployment zone to deployment zone shooting. I try to promote a balanced table, even if it's symmetric or asymmetric, it doesn't matter. I don't want a player to look at a board that I've built and go, well, uh, if this is my deployment zone, I just lose because it's my deployment zone. I try to make sure each objective has some sort of cover or protection, whether it's I can sit in a footprint and hold the objective or I can hide behind a footprint somewhere and hold the objective. I try to make sure that it, interaction exists. And then whatever you, you put, whatever you like on the table. If you like forest, put forest on the table. I would just treat them as ruins and ultimately that's that's what i would do make sure if you're using armor containers and barricades uh, i would honestly like double or triple stack some of those just so you have taller things to help block line of sight if you're not using a lot of ruins you know if you wanted to do a real cool themed table you could do it a like a cargo like a shipping shipyard right and then you could just have like three and four stack armor containers that almost make like a maze and that would be really cool and by because you're stacking some of them so high it would help block line of sight and keep you from getting shot off the table by bigger shooting platforms maybe like some knights or some riptides or things of that nature so it's one of those where you know be creative have fun with the game and then figure out ways to balance your terrain after you've decided what type of features you like and then like I said, remember that the terrain should make sense and promote a fair and balanced game. If you are doing a theme or narrative game, this becomes a little bit less important, but you still want to make sure both players are having fun. You know, so that's that's the things I would say to you if you are creating a terrain layout or a table. 
Uh, if you are interested in seeing some of the layouts that I have created, feel free to drop a comment. I will share them in a Google Drive. Uh, I can actually just share my my tournament organization packet for you guys if you like. Just let me know in the comments and I can share that Google link with you. Thanks a lot. Big shout out to my hatchlings. Real Donnie G, again, appreciate you, man. Uh, I think we're at your one-year anniversary here pretty soon, so big shout-out to you. I appreciate it, buddy. Uh, Phoenix, Jamie, thank you for the support. I appreciate it a lot. Immortals, Lord Wellingstone, Danny Boy, and Captain Too Tall, thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate the support. It's gone a long way to helping me run events. We have had a very healthy community build up over the last couple of years, and a big part of it is uh, thanks to your donations. Thanks for watching. Again, if you're you're still with me, remember to check me out on Twitch. I do live stream, uh, but I do multi-stream, and it's it's a hassle. But I do I'm getting it figured out, you know. So we do Twitch and YouTube live streams, and then we also do. Uh, I've got my spring store. We do themed merch. I'm going to be adding some more cups. I'm going to make a big glass collection. We've got some fantasy themed stuff going up. So big shout out there. Check it out if you like it. Uh, pick something up it's christmas time everybody could use a new eggnog glass and then i am building my website it is not fully stocked yet we are going to be reopening my account with games workshop in january and then the web store will continue to grow as of right now it should be roughly 10 percent off of all retail and then if you are a five dollar level patron or higher you will be getting a coupon code to get you an additional 10 percent off of everything you buy at my store uh and i think that covers it thanks for hanging out with me you guys are awesome have a great day